All right, so good afternoon again. Today I'll be talking about deep learning for precision psychiatry. Uh, for a little bit of background, I'm the CTO of AFRID Health, which is a startup that works uh, to develop a physician patient tool to improve the treatment of patients who suffer from depression. And so what I want to talk about today is the fact that we're currently suffering from a crisis in psychiatry. The pharmaceutical industry has failed to develop effective treatments for most neuropsychiatric indications, in particular mood disorders and depression. Today, we're still relying on semi-effective drugs that were developed many decades ago, and um, drug discovery efforts have been unable to yield better than the existing treatments on the market. In fact, in recent years, many big pharma companies have either heavily reduced or shut down entirely their psychiatric research divisions and budgets. But now it is a more crucial time than ever to invest in brain health. We have a big problem in psychiatry. The rates of cognitive and aging associated diseases are only rising. Depression has become the leading source of disability burden in the world out of any medical condition. 8% of, world, of the world's population were, will suffer in their lifetime. Currently, the proportion of the global population living with depression right now is estimated to be 4.4% of the world's population. There's a significant socioeconomic burden costing over $125 billion in direct health care costs per year in the U.S. alone. And that's not including another $90 billion in indirect health care costs. In addition, due to the current crisis, we can see that mental health outcomes are, are, uh, are decreasing. So what we can see is that 31% of US adults are reporting that they're struggling with anxiety or depression symptoms. In Canada, almost one quarter of a crowdsourced survey done by, the, by Statistics Canada reported fair or poor mental health, which compares to 8% the year prior. Finally, a first of its kind study from the Boston University School of Public Health finds that 27.8% of adults had depression symptoms based on a standard test compared to 8.5% before the COVID-19 pandemic. This is problematic when we consider that almost 67% of people suffering from depression do not respond to their first treatment and nearly 25% do not respond to their fourth. What we experience right now is really a trial and error approach to selecting treatments, even at the level of specialists. We don't actually know which treatment is going to work for who. And a large underlying reason for this is because we don't actually understand the complex ideology of most mental health disorders. We know that uh, new CNS medications fail phase three clinical trials more than usual. So that means thousands of patients. And one possible explanation for this is that there's an incredibly diverse neurobiological and environmental factors that contribute to the clinical presentation of these disorders. These factors vary between individuals and for each patient, we don't know which of these factors are contributing most to their current experience. In fact, traditional statistics may not be able to adequately capture patient heterogene heterogeneity. And so this is a big reason why we've seen traditional statistical methods and traditional methods for determining the best treatments failing. The scientific method will say, make an observation, form a question, form a hypothesis, conduct an experiment, analyze the data, draw a conclusion. This is what we've been doing in the world of psychiatry for years. However, when it comes to the current issue that we're experiencing in psychiatry, we propose that we need to flip this on its head and have an instill a paradigm shift, where instead we extract the most telling features in a sea of noise or a sea of data, because we don't currently know which combinations of features and which specific features will contribute to finding the most salient information regarding the best treatment for a patient. And how would we do this? And how would we capture this heterogeneity in patients? Well, we at AFRID Health think that the answer is deep learning. So deep learning is a type of machine learning used in artificial intelligence, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, they, artificial, 
Neural networks were originally modeled after the primary visual cortex in the central nervous system, wherein we have several layers of neurons that are interconnected. These nodes capture relationships and patterns within the inputs, create a representation, and then makes a certain classification as defined in the output layer. Deep learning is neural networks on steroids. There are multiple layers that are fully connected and which create increasingly abstract representation of our inputs. Deep learning is very effective, as I'm sure you're aware, at solving complex problems. Most popular applications include real-time translation, self-driving cars, and image recognition. So as I'm sure you're aware, it's very popularly used for image recognition. We can, for example, distinguish between a labradoodle or a fried chicken or a chihuahua or a muffin. But something that isn't so commonly applied is the idea of using deep learning for psychiatry. Why do we think that deep learning would work well for psychiatry? Well, first of all, deep neural networks are very flexible and work well with sparse, high-dimensional, multimodal data. And then this is particularly useful in psychiatry, where we have to pool many data sets in order to have sufficient sample sizes, and which often have a lot of missing data in terms of certain variables. In, pharma, in pharmacogenic genetics, for example, there are tons of polymorphisms and variants that are often implicated. Because you can define the number of hidden layers you want in your model, and this is where the word deep comes from, Deep learning is able to capture increasingly complex and abstract representations of your data. This is relevant because, again, psych psychiatric indications have incredibly diverse neurobiological underpinnings. And finally, perhaps the most important, is that deep learning can elucidate the features in a data set that have the most salience in terms of your model's prediction. This provides interpretability to doctors who are using the outputs of neural network predictions. So you can see here what we have in terms of traditional machine learning. You have your input, you have to perform some sort of feature extraction, then you use um, a network or some sort of model to uh, perform classification and finally have your outputs. With deep learning, what we can do is we can combine the feature extraction with the classification. What this means is that we're able to use machine learning techniques to extract the most salient features from the data without having our, the need for input human biases. Because what we know is that we don't know very well in psychiatry what variables contribute most to treatment selection. We want the data to be able to tell us what it thinks is the most important. Um, and this will allow us to find which features are most relevant in predicting psychiatric responses to treatment, which will allow us, for example, in turn to collect more data that's relevant to those features, thereby improving future predictions. So several years ago, our research group conducted the largest systematic meta-review of significant predictors of antidepressant treatment response. We screened thousands of reviews and included about 200. There were six groups in which these possible predictors of response could be classified. Demographic, symptom profile, comorbidities, peripheral markers, genetic, and neuroimaging-based predictors. We identified a total of 100, 221 predictors of antidepressant treatment response. It is obviously unrealistic to ask doctors to have all their psychiatric patients undergo all types of peripheral marker and genetic assays and neuroimaging scans. It's likely that many of these features are collinear or redundant, and that a model that uses significantly less features to predict antidepressant treatment response may be able to do just as well. So what we need to do is use deep learning to extract the most relevant features. We do this by using our publicly published open deep learning framework that we call Vulkan. So the machine learning team at AFRID has developed an open and modular deep learning framework. Its core functionality pillars are the ability to easily characterize your data, rapidly prototype modular networks in order to best optimize your networks, and provide post hoc model interpretability methods, methods all standardized, in order to better understand why your deep learning model made the decisions that it did. We have an entire pipeline process for how 
we, we go through and process our data. So what we do is we start with the raw data set. We will go through and we'll fill in any of the missing data. We'll perform uh, feature selection using a variety of techniques, including those where the feature selection is fully integrated into the, the neural network, as well as feature se selection techniques, which utilize other machine learning models. Um, we then um, go through our neural network development phase, which involves several iterations in terms of the exact optimization parameters. We perform our, our final tests on the model. And then what we do is we enter two distinct analysis phases that enable us to say whether or not our models actually performed as desired on our, our, um, our um, test data sets. So to deep dive into this, we first have what we call um, a naive differential analysis. So we take a patient and for each patient, we have a number of different features uh, and we run, the, uh, we run through the neural network multiple times, giving a patient a specific treatment. So our goal is to see how does the network think they will do in terms of remission from depression if they were given that specific treatment. Uh, we get a probability of remission for each single drug. We keep the drug with the highest probability of remission, and we continue this for a certain set of subjects. Once we've found the drug that gives uh, each individual patient the highest probability of remission, we take the average probability of remission for the entire validation set. This gives us an idea of how well our um, selection of best treatments will perform at the population level. We also go through a conservative analysis uh, through a process that we called uh, bootstrap KFOL validation. So what we do is we sample from our entire data set. We train our model um, split 10 times into 10 folds and test each time on each fold. We pull subjects individually from the test set and loop through assigning each of those subjects one of the four possible medications or drugs and get the probability of remission for each drug for each patient. If the drug with the highest probability of remission was the drug that they actually received in real life in the study data sets that we're using as our source, then we keep the subject in the data set and else we remove the subject. We then get the average probability of remission. From this, we're able to tell how well we do on those who actually received the drugs that we think that they should have received. So on a um, test where we use two uh, different clinical trial data sets, we were able to achieve an AUC of 0.69, uh, which is above um, uh, the current standard for, for this prediction task, considering that it is both very difficult and that we see overall uh, about 35% of patients going into remission from depression. Um, and in our naive analysis, we found a 32% relative improvement in remission rate. So going from 34% to 46%. And then in our conservative analysis, um, we found a 7.2 relative improvement in remission rate with a p-value of 0 0.01. So this was uh, generated over a thousand iterations. And this is, again, where we compare the improvement scores between patients who actually received a recommended treatment and those who were allocated treatment as per study protocols. So how do we actually integrate the, our, this AI model into a solution? How do we bring this to doctors in the real world? Well, what we have is we have a physician-patient software platform. And what this platform allows doctors and patient, patients to do is participate in um, um, participate in the, the treatment tracking and monitoring process. So what the patient will do is they'll fill out certain questionnaires, standardized questionnaires that a physician would normally ask, but on paper. Uh, they'll do this using either a desktop or a mobile app. 
they will uh, um, complete these at standard intervals of time. And then the physician will be able to see the results of these questionnaires. So this is really a, a key uh, tool for the physician because they're able to see how a patient's results change over time when they are given a new treatment, which we also allow them to record, uh, when they're influenced by other results, et cetera. And uh, this also allows the patient to feel more involved in their care. The idea is that this tool augments but does not replace physician, physicians and integrates into the clinical workflow. So ultimately what we have under the hood is two different things. We have a clinical algorithm and then we have the AI model that I just spoke of. So the clinical algorithm is really a instantiation of the coded best practice guidelines. So it allows physicians to optimize treatment management. What this means is that the physician will, will go through uh, a series of decision tree questions that ask them um, uh, questions about their patient's current uh, status, about what sort of care they've been given previously, and then it'll provide them with uh, what the best practice guideline says that they should do. At the end of this, what we have is we have a, a treatment selection page. And what this treatment selection page does is it provides the probability of remission for each medication. And this is provided by the AI model that I was just spe speaking of. So really we've got these two, um, two different pieces within this app that also allows for uh, symptom tracking and shared um, symptom tracking between the patient and the and the patient and the physician. Uh, and between the two of these, they really um, will allow us to greatly improve clinical outcomes. So with the clinical algorithm, we're hoping to achieve up to a 50% reduction in time to remission, which is based on results from third-party published studies. Um, and then um, with the AI, up to a 48% relative improvement in rates of remission. Overall, what this means is that we'll be able to not only improve uh, outcomes for for patients and reduce the time to remission, reduce the amount of time that is spent choosing a uh, depression treatment for them, but also improve uh, outcomes for their families, for doctors, and for the medical system as a whole. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. I'm, I'll be ready for any questions at the end. Fantastic, Katrin. Thank you. Um, and, and that last slide shows your um, email, aredhealth.com. Yes, it does. Um, yes. So what staggering data you're dealing with. And um, wow, wow, wow. Um, I've got a question here from Jasper. A couple of questions if we've got time um, that, that, that I've got for you as well. Um, but sure. let's to our audience. So can a mental health patient's responses to survey questions really be trusted? Um, have you seen discrepancies between what the patient thinks of themselves and what the physician has determined? How's that? So in response to this, there are some questionnaires that are designed to be uh, patient response questionnaires, and then other questionnaires that are designed to be physician response questionnaires. And so this is something that we, we follow. So we use those questionnaires as, as intended, those that um, are usually would have the patient ticking boxes on paper. We have the, the patient um, ticking boxes on, on the screen. Um, and then those that are physician response questionnaires, we would have the physician asking the patient. So we yeah. really follow the standards there. There's a lot going on. I mean, I anyway, I'll, I'll move on to this other question that's sort of steering us away from pharma and asking, Roger's asking, has the company looked at any drug-free treatments for depression given the staggering growth and, um, you know, mm -hmm. he, vitamins, different diet, time spent outdoors in the park. Um, 
that would be interesting. Is that something you're also focusing on with deep learning? So that's absolutely something that we are very aware of. We absolutely want to integrate. The restriction for us is data. We have to have data in order to integrate it into our model. And the reality is right now, there's way more clinical trials with way, way larger numbers of subjects for the, the different medications. That doesn't mean that we don't provide these as treatment options. We have them as treatment options in our, um, in our algorithm and on the treatment selection page. But until we're able to get enough data, we can't reasonably provide um, a prediction for them, or not a prediction, sorry, uh, the, the remission probability. Um, we're working to get this data, but ultimately um, it has it has to be collected. And something we're hoping to do as well when we bring on more and more patients is be, be able to collect that data ourselves. So we'll be able to improve our models, bring on more treatments, et cetera, as we collect more data as well. Right. So the use of AI to accomplish so much, what would you like to share with our audience what what would you what what, what have, what's been surprising to you what what about what's been surprising to me is is the staggering amount of data you've just shared but to you Katrin what what keeps you going in this area well I really think that we can make an impact it's very clear every time we go out and we talk to people about what we're doing that people have been impacted by not only depression but the amount of time that it takes and the frustration that it, the toll that it takes in terms of finding an actual treatment, whatever that treatment may be. Yeah, there's, there's long wait times, there's difficulty getting to resources. And then there's the guess and check method in terms of actually finding the right medication for a specific person. And it's that, that we're trying to improve. So I, I really see us as having such a huge potential to impact so many people who are suffering from from these sorts of mental illness. Yeah, there's room for a lot of innovation. Um, some more questions, they're, they're starting to pile up. How do you manage um, collecting and integrating the genomic data? Did you have that for all patients or were you able to impute it when it was missing from Catherine here? So great question. In our current models, we're not including the genetic data simply because it's not available for most of the clinical um, trial data sets. And it's something that would be great to be able to collect in the future. We, we know that it's out, out of many potential features that could be a potential feature. But what we also know is that there are many other features, sociodemographic, symptom-based, et cetera, that give us this ability to make predictions. So we're focusing on the data that we can access now, not including the genomics, but we're aware that in the future, that would also be something that is of great interest to include. So I've got Elsa Nussi asking, how do you get more patients? How do we get more patients? Well, uh, we're, we're currently recruiting for a number of different studies and pilots, et cetera, for, uh, for our own. Uh, and then in terms of bringing on data, we've been working with a number of different organizations to get access to what is mostly clinical trial data. So when patients, let's say 500 of them, uh, half of them were given venlafaxine, half of them were given placebo to judge the efficacy of this, this medication against placebo, we can use that data very effectively, combine it with thousands of other patients from other clinical studies mm -hmm. and then use that to make predictions on how well we think venlafaxine will interact with certain typologies of patients. So this might be a good segue to um, a question from Swarmo who's asking, you mentioned filling in missing data but yeah. how do you fill in missing data? Some of your 221 features do not lend to that if that's okay to ask that as quite a specific. So so there are a number of different data imputation techniques. I won't speak to the exact one that we choose, but it's something that um, is very possible given that you have enough data uh, from, from uh, the, the patient otherwise and the rest of the data set. So obviously we're not trying to 
uh, make up fake data, but rather deal with the fact that you need to have a value when a patient ultimately has a, a NAN right. uh, in place. So there's a number of different ways that we can reasonably deal with this. And we deal with this very conservatively because we're aware that what we're then doing is we're using our model in the real world with data from real patients. Okay. Um, here's another question from just a minute. Um, sorry. I think it's from Catherine. How do you manage... Oh, no, we did the genomic question. My apologies. My apologies. I think... Um, oh, dear. Let me... Give me one second. Oh, no worries. There's, there's quite a bit coming. And... Mm, okay. Let's see how this goes. Um, oh, okay. The, the, there's some sharing of, of suggestions, something from Roger saying the most important lesson from 83,000 brain scans, a reference here to Daniel Amen, um, TEDx, Orange Coast. So there's a YouTube there. And Dr. Amen does actual brain scans and visualizes the brain before recommending any treatments or drugs could it be used with ai is is the question so i think what's important to consider when it comes to imaging is that it's expensive in terms of both uh, ai cost so it's much much more computationally expensive to run models on images and then also in terms of cost to the medical system and to patients and also in terms of time so what we have is something that can be done the same day, the patient comes in, they answer some questions, they say, they give us some of their sociodemographic background, they give us some of their symptomology, they give us um, some of their physiological um, uh, data. And what that means is we can take all of that and then immediately turn it into um, the, the treatment selection page where we have the um, remission probabilities listed for each medication. And then the doctor can then use that uh, to make, um, to inform their selection. So we're really, we don't want to increase the time that it takes to actually get to a, a treatment selection, particularly because of the pressure that the health system is under. Right. So I think that we've just about run out of time. Um, Thank you so much, Katrin. Um, lots of questions. Thanks, audience, for those amazing questions too. Um, and um, I, yeah, I, thank you. I think you had the honour of being our um, last um, speaker at this. Um, wow, Katrin. So um, thank you for that, and thank you all so much for attending.